All right, uh, another episode of the Industrialist Podcast, and today we have a uh, depth of knowledge subject matter expert with us today, Stuart Lawton from Higer Allen Lawton Law Firm here in Dallas, Texas. Stuart, thank you for being here today. My pleasure. Good afternoon, and you pronounced that just perfectly. Thank you for that. You know, it's funny, my wife would always get these invoices and she goes, who is Higgier? Yeah, that's a hard one. I was like, that's a very difficult one. (laughs) So, um, but um, Stuart uh, uh, is our attorney uh, on the real estate side of things here at uh, Matador. And uh, we work intimately with him constantly and um, on all of our transactions. And uh, it's just always been a pleasure. And and, I just thought it'd be great for you to get on here and kind of, you know, unlock the, the years of knowledge that you have and uh you know in a short period of time we want to we want to get it all out of you so yeah jeremy i'm i'm uh, i'm really i'm i'm happy to share and, and that sounds very trite but the reality of it is that uh based on where i am in my career i've come to a place where i share more and more and really have come to enjoy sharing more and more mm-hmm. I'll, I'll i'll explain in, in a moment yeah yeah no um so let's just let's just kind of start. Where'd you grow up? Right. Well, trick question. Can you? T- yeah, I've known you for years. Yeah, I don't think I've ever shared this with you. Can you tell by my accent? What's your guess? I don't have a guess by accents because Texas has so many different people. But I'm going to use some context clues that's somewhere in the Northeast. Okay. All right. I know why you would say that, and I get that a lot. And I get Midwest a lot, but the reality of it is that I, we are today sitting in Plano, Texas, a suburb of Dallas, and I was born in Dallas, Texas, but my mom's from Minneapolis, my father's from Copenhagen, Denmark, and even growing up in, in as a Texan, I never got a good, solid Texas accent, and I can't even fake it. <laughs> I wish so, I could. So there were many times and I wish I could, seriously. So, so born and raised, but you couldn't you couldn't you couldn't get it, huh? Couldn't get the big text in I, you. I, I, I couldn't get the big draw <laughs> out of it. And I, I don't even own any cowboy boots either. What high school did you go to? That's another that's a, another more detailed question than it should be. I uh, mostly went to St. Mark's uh, school. It's a prep school in Dallas. Yeah. 7th, 8th, ninth, 10th, 11th, I was invited not to return for my senior year at St. Mark's. I went to a public school in the DISD system for my senior year where I was invited not to return there after one semester. So the cold reality of it is that I did not graduate high school and I cannot run for public office. <laughs> but you got into college. In those years, uh, if you had an SAT score that was high enough and other testing and your entry application check cleared the bank, that was all that was required. Wait a second. This is kind of fascinating. Wait a second. You didn't graduate high school. Correct. You do not have a high school diploma. Jeremy, that's correct. My first public admission. Is this going to be broadcasted? <laughs> <laughs> no, this is just between us and Isabella. <laughs> Okay, but you get into SMU. Yeah, I actually got into BU, not the BU in Waco, but the BU in Boston for my first semester and started there. Uh, I was 18. I returned to Dallas for a holiday break in December. My father died. I ended up having to stay in Dallas and um, run his business. And that's what ultimately led me, after I sold the business, to restart my college career and and restart at SMU. What kind of business did your dad Yeah, run? that's a great question. He had a music store in uh, downtown Dallas, and we sold uh, re- records and uh, guitars and amps, drums, harmonicas. And I was a, uh, I was a god. I, I was I was a music god in, in those years. This is you know after the Beatles, after the Stones. But I invented you know Steely Dan, and guys would get on their knees and and pray to me <laughs> as I walked down my high school hallways because 
I was the guy that got the first Steely Dan or Yes or Led Zepp or any of those. We we didn't sell rock and roll in the, my record store. It was, man, it was Motown. It was blues. It was R&B. It was jazz, spirituals, um, very few classical, very, very little rock because it was a downtown music store. Yeah. Where, where was this at in downtown? Uh, Elm and Pearl on the corner of Elm and Pearl, 2202 oh. Elm Street. Okay, so right on the edge of Deep Ellum. Right. You know the address. Mm-hmm. My landlord was Saul Ballas, who I think family still owns that that property, that building. Are you familiar with the Ballas family? I'm not familiar with them, but I lived in Deep Ellum after I was I knew that. When, after I was not invited back to the neighborhood I moved into after I graduated college. And that was because of my music in the a lot of what is it cacophony that it uh, created. Um, I was living in a, um, in a house in Euless and you know, it was a quiet family neighborhood on a cul-de-sac and <laughs> me and my buddies leased a house. And you know, there's, I had a full on stack of amps just blaring out of there. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, and that's, and so we eventually, we really got the message that we weren't, you know, our landlord loved us. We paid our rent on time, but the neighbors were like, you know, you don't belong here. And so my buddy <laughs> said, like, Hey, let's move to deep Ellum. And I was like, well, I'm, I'd love to move in Deep Ellum, but I was like, I gotta have a place to put my gear, and that's how I got into the rehearsal studio business. Is I found a rehearsal studio. So, um, but uh, the um, but yeah, no, that's that's uh, that's fascinating. I didn't know you you had the the music background. I know you, mm. I know you you like the tunes, but I didn't know you had all that. I like too. the tunes. I played classical violin from uh, first grade to what should have been my senior year. <laughs> so I've got a kind of a violin background. As Do you well. still play? You no. Know, uh, Something happened with that, and I put it down after my senior year in high school and never felt I was good enough. I was first chair, first symphony, first orchestra, first everything. Didn't matter. I never felt happy with it, and, yeah. I, never, and I never went back. You know, I kind of understand that. Sometimes I feel like I write things, and I'm like, you know, oh, you know, you know, I still actively play in a band and stuff, and I write things, and I'm like, this like I, I I remember when we listened to our CD when we mixed it and I was like I sound terrible like I just I'm I'm not really I, I've probably listened to that album three times since we made it it must be a common issue that you're just never satisfied with your own performance I don't care if you're you know Joe Satriani I, I don't care who you are it could be Carlos Santana you're probably just never really satisfying and maybe it's that you know you hear something from one person you hear someone tell you something and it doesn't resonate and then someone else tells you the same thing a different way maybe a little bit maybe. And, it, and, it, and it does resonate i don't know but i i have that same issue i'm never satisfied with anything that that we produce that that i'm involved in but I've I heard just, your stuff, man. By the way, I love it. <laughs> Great. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for the opportunity to see it live. Well, we did just book a show. So um, we're in two, two of my guys, uh, they're full-time touring guys. they are been running front of house for real bands and on the road, but they're coming back, and we're going to start booking the shows up. So we just got one booked for April, but we'll start getting them lined out for next year. I'm there so. for the rock piece of it. When, yeah. it, when it's C&W, I'm leaving. Yeah, I got you. Well, if I'm singing this the rock piece, when the other guy does go to the bars. <laughs> so, okay, so you go to SMU, and you get a business degree at SMU. I do. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. what what kind of business degree was it? Yeah, a uh, bachelor's of business degree with a, a major in um, computer computing science actually. And and then after call after undergraduate um, unusual for those years, very typical for today years, I did not go right into law school. I was in business for several years mm-hmm. um, doing my business thing and honestly banking enough coin to attempt to go to law school because we were, we had little, we, we, we certainly weren't poor. I don't mean to say that. We were probably somewhere on the rung of some middle class somewhere, but Clearly didn't have enough for law school, barely had enough for undergraduate. And were it not for various loans and grants and scholarships, and I wouldn't have even gotten all the way through undergraduate. So so I was able to bank some some coin over a, a couple of years. And then I've got uh, 
none in Dallas, but I have uh, uncle lawyers in Minneapolis, my mother's brother, other family members, lawyers in um, Washington. I have an underwear uncle in Dallas that had a law degree. It never used it. He sold Fruit of the Loom underwear at wholesale instead. And cousins, first cousins that are lawyers in Atlanta. Anyway, something that I'd always dreamed about, always dreamt about, always had in the back of my mind, something I, I'd, I'd always wanted to pursue. Never thought that I would have the um, the chance because of economics, honestly. Yeah. But at those years, I was single, no car payments, apartment rent was nothing. I really had no obligations. My siblings had, had left. I, I'm the, I was the baby. It was just me and my mom. My mom was kind of financially self-sufficient. So then I was able to, to take a chance and do something that I'd always wanted to do. So what was the time from when you graduated from SMU to then when you went to law school? Was uh, that only, gap? Two year, only, only two years. Only a two-year gap. That's okay. All. So so you go to law school, and then what's law school? Two and a half years, three years? Or? Yeah, law school's three. Okay. Um, you can accelerate it a little bit, maybe, by taking some summer classes. And I mostly, same thing, I mostly had to work. I worked all the way through law school. I worked in those summers, so I, I really wasn't able to hit the accelerator. It, it really took me three years to get through it, which is a whole nother sidebar issue, maybe content for another day. The things that you're not taught in law school that are so critically important to being successful, but I don't doubt that's today's subject. Well, you know, but and so, so the same thing happened. Like, I was terrible at accounting. I got my degree in finance, but my, the, when I had to take an accounting class, like the teacher literally passed me just because I tried, but I, I didn't get it. I don't know why I didn't get it. But then I got embezzled or I got some money. There was some money missing in a company I owned and I learned accounting real quick. And now I know accounting inside and out. And I've, so it's, <laughs> it was a skill set I picked up quickly, but I picked it up really by owning a business, like, you know, and so it probably in law school, there's probably some things you can't teach that experience, like actually is what gives it to you. Yeah. Experience is a great, is a great teacher, but accounting is a perfect example. There's some very basic elemental accounting that should be taught to every lawyer. I don't care what you're going to do. You can be a criminal lawyer or a family lawyer, security, an admiralty lawyer. I don't care. <laughs> There's still some some very basic tenets of accounting that you need to know to, to be successful, to run your to run your business, to be a, even a component part of a big firm. None of that's taught. Yeah, no, it's it's not. Well, okay, so you get out of SMU Law. Where where do you get your first law job? Get at? out of SMU Law. Yeah. Um, so I'm a brand new baby lawyer, and I. People, even even in those years, uh, a whole uh, century ago, people specialized somewhat. Some were kind of GPs and did everything. Others took the opportunity to say, I know I want to be X. Because I'd had a business background, a retail background, music background, I kind of knew that I, I will use the word sit-down lawyer as opposed to a stand-up lawyer. Stand-up lawyers are litigators. And Bella's going, yeah, I get that. <laughs> and sit-down lawyers are everyone else. The whole community of all lawyers that are not stand-up lawyers are sit-down lawyers, meaning they're not litigators. So I wanted to be a business lawyer. And within the context of business law, I, even in those years, wanted to be a real estate lawyer. I found my way to a... Um, now, before I go there, I went to uh, what to, uh, then was called the uh, GDAR, Greater Dallas Association of Realtors. And I knocked on the door and said, what do you guys do? And they explained it. And I said, I've got a crazy idea. Do you have an in-house lawyer? No. I said, do you engage a law firm that regularly represents? Yeah. And his name is whatever. I said, okay. I found that guy in Dallas, knocked on his door. He had a five-man law firm. A week later, it was a six-man law firm. So I, I joined that, and it turned out to be a residential real estate law firm representing buyers and sellers and title companies and surveyors, everything that goes with it, but also brokers and sales agents. And 
that's where I first got my uh, entree into the world of realtors and brokers and licensed sales agents and the, all the laws and, 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 and rules and regulations that bind them. And, you know, they're a million. Yeah. So um, also with that, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking too much on this topic, but it's kind of fun. We had antitrust lawyers, trade restraint lawyers in our little group of six. He said, well, that makes no sense if you're servicing the residential realtors. But even in those years, all those years ago, all the real estate agents uh, were being sued for trade restraint and antitrust because of the National Association of Realtors was passing on their compensation system and they were being challenged constantly that there was price fixing. It, price fixing was set at 6% all across the country. So we were defending those locally while NAR in Chicago was defending those nationally. And why even bring that up? It's so topical because now NAR has just lost that huge lawsuit and is responsible. The jury verdict is $1.8 billion. Right. The judge is getting ready to triple that, apparently, and turn it into a judgment, and things are going to get very interesting in the residential real estate world. So I'm glad you brought that case up, because I've seen the the clippings of it, but I don't really understand it. Can you explain what's going on there? Because that's a big headline right now going yeah, on. Yeah, that's, that's a big deal. And and the reason it's a big deal is just by context, by history, and 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 many of your listeners may not may not know, but realtors have been set with this six percent compensation platform since Noah in the Ark, and it's been split. Residential real, realtors, that is, it's been split. 50-50 between the listing agent and the uh, and the agent that brings the, the buyers, three percent each. And just to be clear, there's there's no such thing as a realtor in commercial real estate, right? That's, no, no, there is. you you can be a realtor and you can join. No, 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 the, no, but but you don't. You ask any commercial guy, he's not a realtor. Okay. So, <laughs> um, so, so yeah. So to that that point, that's a good. One. We're only talking about residential right now. They're the ones that have set this commission. Uh, I don't want to call it a scheme, but a, 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 a commission platform for years and years and years. And everyone else has fallen into place. And the way they've been so successful with it is by saying we have one platform in which you can market your real estate. It's called MLS, Multiple Listing Service. Right. And it's owned by the realtor group in Chicago, NAR. And it is uh, subsumed across the country by various little agencies, one of which is in our metro area, but they're all over the United States. They each run their own little MLS. And the MLS is a closed shop. You and I cannot enter. We cannot access. We cannot obtain any information. Only if you're a Realtor member. So the Realtor members control this marketplace and they offer to those realtors who represent buyers a share of the pie, a share of the commission. So that incentivizes sellers and owners to go into this marketplace because there's this closed shop of realtor community that can find me a buyer. And the way they'll, they're incentivized to do that by this half of 6%. And it has grown in, uh, all across the United States. Uh, but it, it appears that it runs afoul of these federal laws that we've had for right at 100 years. The Sherman Act, Clayton Act of 1933, 1934 say all this is price fixing and it's all illegal. Smart lawyers have defended it for 100 years. It finally looks like it's going to end. It already has ended in New York, in New York City, and now buyers who engage realtors in the residential world, world pay their own realtors. Sellers are not paying those realtors. Buyers are. Oh, wow. That's, that's interesting. So, but aren't, if two parties agree to pay a fee and everybody's happy with it, like what's the big deal? Yeah, the big deal is that because this website is uh, locked and there's no access to the platform and because they control the database, 
from coast to coast across the whole United States that there's no competition. There's no room. They've edged out all the other competition. I mean, it's kind of a brilliant business strategy, right? But it does run afoul of antitrust and trade restraint laws. Well, then don't municipalities fall into antitrust? Because um, where you hit utilities, water utilities, Is anybody that, that works that? at the city, any building inspector, because they don't have competition. They don't have competition. And well, I wish they did. You have a choice, right? You can move. You can move. You cannot build in your city. You can pick another <sighs> city. But they're all the same people. <laughs> Another topic. <laughs> um, now, you're, you're showing some frustration there, are you, Jeremy? Uh, no, I'm just Is there something personally you'd yeah. like to share with so, this, Jeremy? But, so this isn't an issue in the commercial world because we don't use MLS in commercial world. Everybody uses CoStar, which is technically the same thing as a monopoly. But there are other service providers within exactly. commercial real estate. But CoStar has bullied most of them out and brought their B minus product to market. Right. There so, are competitors. Uh, uh, what was I looking at the other day? Crexy is one. and Crexy. There's others. Well, Does Re Real Reology have one? I have Reonomy, but it doesn't, that's more of a data service for just gathering data. But, you know, the, the listing service is really lives in, in CoStar. Then you have LoopNet, but that's owned by CoStar. LoopNet. Yeah. Um, so it's really LoopNet is where kind of the users of space end up looking online and co-stars where the brokers live and share information more or less. So it, it's, uh, but, uh, you know, the one thing that I always did like about the MLS system is that the information is good because they won't allow you to load anything into the MLS without having all of the information. But in commercial, it is a, Total mess. It's it's where appraiser commercial appraiser appraisers really suffer. <laughs> I oh, yeah. think residential appraisers who have access to MLS are gonna get it right. Yeah. Commercial appraisers who have only CoStar and I mean they they're they're gonna suffer. Well because it, that data is like as not is not correct. No, it's not correct. And then the other thing is to now, Texas is a non-disclosure state. Right. But the MLS kind of circumvents that. Right. Well, you check a box when you do a listing that says, I'm willing to disclose my data or not. But most of the world isn't reviewing that form agreement very closely. Yeah, they're so just the box just automatically and... gets checked. Sure, disclose my information. So in the commercial world, you know, it's the the information is just so poor. It's... But, but, you know, from the appraisal side of things, those appraisers, I mean, usually how an appraisal works is they call the listing broker and be like, do you have all the comps for me? Because, you know, but the difference is, too, buildings are so uniquely different from one to another compared to a 3-2, you know. So, but at the same time, like, the appraiser, I, I could see your point, though. Like, they, they should be able to nail an appraisal on a on a house in an afternoon, in my opinion, you know. So... I think commercial, you know, income approach and replacement approach, all, all those different mechanisms to replace. Right. right. It gets complicated. So what significant changes in Texas real estate law have you seen over your career that were kind of really stand out? Changes in real estate law, I guess. And I know you want to focus on commercial. It's the the continuation of the flexibility of commercial landlords that other states don't have that continued flexibility. Let me explain. Consumerism has taken hold all across our country. Texas, no uh, exclusion from that. And so that in, in order to do things with and to consumers, legally various notices have to be have to occur and various steps have to be taken and sometimes uh, letters have to be sent by certified mail return receipt requested not registered mail not fedex not ups and have to be delivered in a certain manner have to be posted in a certain manner and yet our landlord tenant laws remain much more flexible 
and the folks there is remain. They have been that flexible and remain that level, retain that level of flexibility for all these years. Um, meaning my out of state clients are shocked, unbelievably, incredibly shocked to find out that if they're a tenant coming from out of state and they hadn't used a uh, Texas real estate lawyer to negotiate their lease, they are quite surprised to find that if they are accused of a default, the Texas landlord can just simply change their door locks and can simply put a notice on the front door that says, I've changed your door locks, and uh, if you want to come get a new key, I may or may not make it available to you based on how the lease is drafted. And further to that, my out-of-state commercial tenants don't have a Texas lawyer to negotiate their leases are beyond shocked to find that that same landlord has a security interest on their personal property, on the tenant's personal property inside the joint. And that's just one glaring example. As I see consumerism change in the direction of the consumer Texas laws to make it more and more beneficial for the consumer. I don't see that same level of changes for the landlord. It's still, I'm not say wide open for commercial landlords, but commercial landlords in our state have major flexibility. Guys coming from other states would never, ever anticipate. So relocation clause is very funny because I actually have to deal with an industrial every now and then. I'm like, this ain't this. This is stupid. Like, um, uh, Heinz has a project that they do that a lot with. But yeah, so to the point of like, people don't use an attorney to negotiate of a, a binding document that actually has some pretty significant financial ramifications that come with it. It it had really blown my mind, and um, <laughs> you. Know, my worst, my worst tenant rep story ever is I was fired off a tenant rep assignment after I had fully negotiated the LOI and they hired a new tenant rep at that point and told me I had to split my fee with them because they had a better LOI. And I was like, we're at the attorney stage. You understand that, right? Like we're not, we're not an LOI stage. (laughs) This guy's just going to sit back and get a check, you know? So, um, but, uh, yeah, that's always blown my mind, but, I see it, by the way, I see those relocation clauses. I know this is a new, relatively new office for you. I see those in office leases too. Yeah. And which makes more sense because landlords want to consolidate. They, they want to push the little 1200 square foot guy out when a newer player comes in and wants the whole floor or yeah. half a floor or something. Right. But office tenants probably don't care that much. So what? I'm facing north, south, east, west. I'm this close to the restroom. I'm, or maybe I want to be not that close to the restroom, but right. beyond that, it's they, they've got more flexibility. So, but in relocation, like I've never seen it actually happen, but maybe I'm sure you have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I have. Probably the last one was a uh, was a uh, pet store in Dallas who wanted. I mean, it was retail, man. You want your slot because you want your slot. You yeah. want the access point and the parking and the visibility, and you don't want the the tree and the bush in front, and you don't want the median break to be over here or over there. You want it right where it is. And now somebody's asking you to move, and all the <laughs> all the relocation nightmare that goes with the move, particularly when it's not your own, when it's not voluntary, it's horrible. Yeah, it, it's 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 death and taxes, man. It just sucks. Yeah, no, I, I I owned some operating companies and I moved because we just needed to move, and those were steel manufacturing facilities. And I think I'd rather take an ass whipping than do that ever again. Yeah, it's, I, I said my next move is to the morgue. I, yeah. I just can't stand it. <laughs> I just I hate it literally. And I I reserve the hate word for Hitler, but I <laughs> really don't like moving. <laughs> so we were talking about you're talking about the flexibility of the landlords in Texas. So you're also licensed in New York and. I was in New York in July, and at the same time I was up there, a real good buddy of mine, um, one of my best friends, my old roommate from college, his name's Todd Hubbard. He's a, 
he's at NAI, Robert Lynn in um, Fort yeah. Worth. And we were, we were running into the, him and his family were up there at the same time. Our daughters were born the same day and it was both their 13th birthday. So that's why we were up there at the same fun. time. Fun, fun. And, and uh, we were, we were having, and, and his wife, Anita, she, her, her, her brother lives in an apartment up there and they were, and, um, Todd, go, we were sitting there eating breakfast one morning. And Todd's like, you won't believe this, man. Like the landlord tried to raise rent. And when he raised rent, all the tenants stopped paying him and then sued him. They banded together and sued him. And like, they're going to win 50 to a hundred grand a piece on some, like, they're going to own the building. They're going to own the building. Like, how does that? I, so, so you're licensed in New York, so you know the difference. I mean, you, you, you're talking about two drastically different states on landlord laws. So, like, yeah, it's dramatically different. But that's true in a number of states. What we do here is similar. If you kind of draw a north south line from uh, back to Minneapolis, from Minneapolis down to Dallas, and go west. Most of those states are going to be fairly similar. You go east, it's different. And just hop one state over east into Louisiana. We have 49 states that follow the laws of England and from 1066 on. Louisiana follows the Napoleonic Code, and it's very different. Now you go east from there and and, and up the coast, and you get into states like Georgia that has this usufruct law. I'm not even going to try to explain. And you keep going up to the state you're talking about now, New York and, and, and New Jersey. And it's so different. As an example, commercial lenders will ask borrowers to sign with their loan documents, a document uh, called in Latin a, a cognovit agreement, which is a confession lawful in those states, unlawful here. The confession says, uh, dear judge, I acknowledge that I borrowed a million dollars. I acknowledge that I'm a deadbeat. I acknowledge that I defaulted, haven't defaulted yet. I acknowledge that I'm an idiot. I acknowledge that I owe this money to this lender. And lastly, I allow you, Your Honor, to enter a judgment based on these facts willingly. Love, debtor. It is signed. It's notarized. It's, there's a uh, perjury affidavit. It goes in uh, escrow pending a default. Can you imagine doing something like that here, signing a piece of paper? And, and usually it's just that. It's a page. It's two pages that says, dear court, I acknowledge I'm a deadbeat. Even though today is whatever it is, I haven't defaulted. I didn't even get the loan. I don't even have the proceeds yet. So this is this is before the loan's even made? They yeah, right. This As the loan is being paid. It's what, so you've got a promissory note. You have in, in our state a deed of trust. In those states, it's called a mortgage. It's the same thing. And all these related documents towards the end of the pile is something called, you know, we would call it cognovit. You would call it confession of judgment, COJ. In New York, yes. New Jersey, yes. Uh, wish Wilbur was here to ask him if he's seen it before. My <laughs> guess is he probably has. So it's, it, it's just one example of things are very, very, very different there. Kind of, sort of, maybe similar west of our north, due north, and west of our state. Things get very different as we go east. So, but, okay, so that's from the uh, the lender to the borrower, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that's almost like a deed. Is that kind of like a deed in lieu of foreclosure in a way? Um, no, there, there's no transfer. It, okay. All it says is, it says, Your Honor, I'm an idiot, love borrower. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, it's, well, what can they do with that document? That's, so, so great question. Yeah. So now the lawsuit's filed to collect the debt, and here comes this COJ, Convention of Judgment. The debtor can't really overcome that. The debtor can say, um, I was uh, didn't have mental competence when I signed it. Mm -hmm. I was under the influence of an opioid. I was something, something, and something, Your Honor, and therefore I shouldn't be bound by it. 
Good luck with that. So yeah. you can't, it's very difficult to controvert it. So it's one more arsenal in the tool of a lender to get to the promised land should there be a default. So you've got the dead instrument the note, you've got the guarantee, all those things that you're that you see every day, but now you've tacked on one more that makes it very difficult for the debtor to create some space, to kick up some dirt if yeah. there's an allegation of default. Mm-hmm. That one good example. Yeah, I guess your your banker is your partner until there's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another we were just talking about that is is changing door locks. Believe it or not, that is allowed in those states. But if a landlord does it imprudently, improvidently, landlord can be responsible for treble damages. Now, what are the damages? Just changing the door locks? No. The damages are you put a tenant out of business. So, Your Honor, I was expecting a million-dollar paycheck that week, but Mm -hmm. my doors were locked. I couldn't access it. I didn't get my million dollars. If that goes bad, million dollars times three. So I had a very interesting situation one time when I locked out a tenant. I go down on a Saturday morning, lock out a tenant who I figured, you know, they're not going to be there. So good time to lock them out. Locksmith does the lock. The lock like disintegrates, like when he tries to pick it and open it. So anyways, we get into the space. Alarm goes off, you know, the uh, tenant gets notified, the police get notified. You know, I had all my papers posted and everything. And, and um, you know, the tenant, tenant calls me and he's like, hey, do you know what's going on? Or, and I was like, yeah, I, the police called and said you're down there. And I was like, yeah, we're locking you out. And he goes, yeah, I figured, you know, because he knew he hadn't paid. And, uh, and so the Dallas police department, the Dallas police officer starts telling me, he goes, you know, if there's anything missing in there, you're responsible for it. He goes, and you can't do this. You can't lock them out. I go, I think it's in the Texas property code that I can. And he goes, well, not in Dallas. I go, wait a second. There's local property code that trumps state. He goes, yeah. And I was like, so anyways, he goes, how do I even know who you are? And, you know, we had a Mercer company leasing sign on the, on the thing. I go, well, here's my driver's license and there's my name on the building. Like, <laughs> yeah, we, we've we encountered issues like that before. And we'll always tell our clients that are going through that lockout mechanism, dude, but show up with a deed, put, put a deed in your truck. So mm-hmm. if somebody asks, somebody stops you, if you know who the security provider is, see if you can call them in advance, maybe the alarm's still going to go off, but it'd be nice to tip them. But we, we that, that's not all that unusual. Yeah. We've had issues like that before. So uh, I thought you were headed to another place that the tenant was inside. And that's <laughs> a whole nother issue entirely. Well, we've had those too. The most interesting one we did there was Jeff and I go to lock someone out and they're all, they're all in there working. We're like, get out. And the, uh, the tenant, the tenant had purchased the business, but didn't properly get the lease assigned to him and, um, didn't make us aware that this purchase had happened. And, um, he goes, Hey, uh, we're a different company and we don't have a lease with you. Jeff looked at him and goes, great, you're trespassing, get out. (laughs) He was like, what? (laughs) We had the cops there again. And I looked at the police officer. I said, you need to criminally trespass these people. They don't belong here. They just said they don't have a lease and they're, they're occupying the space. And we have, we have electrical, we have water, we have all these things that we need to secure. (laughs) The cop was like, this is a civil matter. I was like, no, it ain't. It's criminal now. Trespassing. (laughs) <laughs> you know, in our state, as state law, you can put up uh, criminal trespass signs, and if they're in certain places of certain sizes and certain colors and other requirements, and, and then people who are not invited to show up on the premises, they can be prosecuted criminally. For yeah. That. So it was, that was very, that was a very funny <laughs> rebuttal. I was, you know, and, and uh, that Jeff came up with. <laughs> on that deal. Um, I can see him doing that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was it was interesting. So, um, well, you know, the um, 
So, so you're licensed in New York also. Why, why are you licensed in New York? Yeah, also? great, great question. I, I've had, I have a, I'm very fortunate. I have clients in New York who buy and sell mostly buy commercial property, really multifamily across the United States. I've assisted one in buying, selling, again, mostly buying in probably 30, 35 states. Mm -hmm. And these are multifamily and the, uh, the range of the purchase prices are kind of 50 million. Their sweet spot is closer to a hundred million goes up to 300 million on occasion. So these are big deals in my world. Oh yeah. And these involve New York lawyers and New York lenders. Didn't matter where the client is based, a client based in Omaha, Mm -hmm. but at that level, you're getting New York lawyers for sellers. You're getting New York lawyers for lenders and all of your loan docs always have a, I'll, I'll use the word a jurisdiction clause, venue clause, that jurisdiction is in New York. Yeah. The entities are always Delaware. It doesn't matter. The default for the whole world is New York. So it helped me to get licensure whenever I did that, not all that long ago, six, seven years ago, to get some knowledge of New York laws, which I I wanted to do anyway. And then I didn't, I I know your follow-up question, no, I did not have to take another bar exam. (laughs) At my level, I was just able to kind of go there and say, this is who I am, mother, may I? And I said, sure, you bet, go do it. No, that's, that's, I always, okay, good. I want to know that question. So, why do people form LLCs in Delaware? Yeah. And why um, am I not doing it if it's something smarter people than me do? Yeah. Texas has great LLC laws. Let me start there. Wyoming has great LLC laws. Delaware is seen as the most business friendly across all 50 states. It's a close margin. Texas, Wyoming are right there with it, 1%, 2% away. If if Delaware is a 10 on our 10 happy scale of corporate laws that benefit business, then Texas, Wyoming are, you know, they're nine, they're nine plus. But in Texas, when you form an entity, you have to disclose certain information to the Texas Secretary of State and to the controller which is public information, there are some, many, who would prefer complete anonymity. Delaware offers complete anonymity in their public filing. If you get into their website right now today and type in the name of a Delaware company, you will find three things. You will find the exact name, you will find the data formation, you will find the name and contact data for their Delaware registered agent. That's it. You will find three lines of data. You will not uh, be able to determine if it's an LLC who the managers are, if it's uh, much less who the owners are, if it's a corporation, you will not be able to determine directors and officers and all those things. Delaware hides those things better than Texas. And I'm, I'm, I'm unsure about Wyoming. Not, not many of my clients use Wyoming. Yeah. So to your question, do you need it? I, I honestly, I doubt that you do. I, no. my guess is you're fine with where you are. Honestly, no. I was just, I was just noticing. You know, we, you and I just got done negotiating a, a JV agreement in um, Delaware. It's law. a Delaware yeah, yeah. Uh, company. Um, yeah, yeah. So, but uh, so now there's an interesting thing, and uh, we use it now. And I want to get your take on this. And Isabella uses it. She's because she can do everything. Chat GPT in law, where is that going to go? Yeah, man, it's it's here. Yeah. <laughs> it is really here right now, as is AI uh, here right now. And those platforms are um, they're, uh, they're live. Yeah. And l- lawyers are using them for research and writing. But there's a stick of dynamite in there because the technology is not such today 
that we can rely on legal research and legal writing. Why do I say that? Again, I'm, I, well, I hate to use Latin. You know what? I'm not going to. Nobody cares. So it's in, in law, it's a function of um, precedent. Let me back up. We gain our obligations in law in two manners. One is codified, right? It's written. The legislature in Austin, wherever it is, they write it. It's signed by the governor and and 90 days later or sometimes on an emergency basis right there. That's law. We have to follow it. Boom. That's clear to the when, when it is clear. <laughs> yeah. But, but but we know how law and sausages are made. But the other way is cases is that which has been litigated to a higher authority. And we call that precedent, precedential value not presidential, but with a C in the middle, not an S. And and when the, the technology platforms are researching and writing, it's not made clear to us that they are looking at these case precedents. And when they do, that they're looking at them properly. And as a function of that, many courts right now are unwilling to accept them. And so when Litigators particularly are filing briefs where they research and they write and they say, well, based on the case of Bill versus Mohammed and the Supreme Court of Texas, 1962 and Southwest second, third and blah, blah, blah. It is stated that blah, blah, blah. There has to be a means to vet that, to research that. And for those lawyers who trust technology and get it wrong, they're in trouble with that judge. They're in trouble with that court. So it's long-winded way of saying it's not ready for us yet. It will be. It will be perfected. It'll be perfected in my lifetime, but it's not today. Now, for you to write some music and a and verse and, and a score <laughs> and, and lyrics, man, great. What an awesome tool. For me, it's not quite ready. So we use it in the sense like we'll it, it instead of what we'll use it as is we, we've actually prompted it to abstract a lease before. Now we go back and read it just because, you know, but but it Isabella wrote up about a 14 point prompt and it powered its way right through it. It came right through it. Yeah. So, you know, when we're buying a multi-tenant asset, that's a nice little yeah, quick yeah. cheat sheet. You know, the other thing too is, you know, we'll do these small bay deals. You're talking about a, you know, 2,000, 3,000 foot warehouse space, not a very big transaction. And there's some nuance in the lease that we need to add. And Isabella can kind of tell it, Hey, give, give us something that sounds kind of like some legal language here. And it, it, it does enough for that. I've seen her writing. She's a very good writer, by yeah. the way. So, but she can, she can grab that and it just, you know, that saves us some money for having to send. It's kind of like, you know, I call it and be like, you know, we don't need to get the big guns out for something like that. No, I get it. You know, I get it. And um, so, uh, so that's been what we've seen with it. But when you talk about precedent, like at the end of the day, that's, that's real application that that machine can't really learn yet. Maybe. Right, right. The machine learning isn't there today. Man, ask me again tomorrow. I may have a different answer. Well, okay. So let's talk about precedent because at the end of the day, that's probably what's going to win out in court is what the precedent is, right? Well, but both. Again, the, the rules that bind us are twofold. On one hand, doesn't matter left or right, nothing political is what happened in our state legislature and, and locally in our municipality has laws. We call them ordinances and counties have laws and regulations and federal system has laws and statutes. And anyway, those are, you know, written, codified. We know what those are, black and white. Hopefully we can understand them. But the other is the precedential value of that which precedential precedes us, that which has been litigated. And the fact that Abdullah sued uh, Shwami and somebody won, somebody lost, doesn't matter. It's when that gets appealed to a higher court who writes an opinion. Now, all of a sudden, light bulbs go on. That maybe has precedential value. And then if it gets appealed again to our Supreme Court, that is meaningful. And if it gets appealed again to the United States Supreme Court, obviously, that's those those are law. With the, what those Supreme Courts say has the effect of law. Yeah. And, and they can change law, and they do change laws and throw out laws. So, so two rules that 
guide our behavior. One's written, one's not. So that that leads me to you know a transaction that we're, we're working on right now, where someone came up and said, "Oh, I forgot to tell you, I have an oral lease." And I'm trying to follow the segue there, but okay. Well, precedent, right? Precedent, okay. Because you kind of told me that he might actually have a case here. Yeah, yeah. Because the precedent might have been set that. Right? Is that is that what we're yeah, saying? Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm 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 trying a little bit slow on the uptake, but I'm I'm tracking now. Yes, there. We here's where cases and laws intersect and explode. There are laws that say that all leases, residential, commercial, office, industrial, warehouse, retail, uh, farming, ranch doesn't matter. All real estate leases must be in writing if the term is more than 12 months. That's what they say. And black and white law. It is It is literally it just those whatever, 10 words. All leases must be in writing with terms that exceed 12 months. If less than 12 months, they can be oral, they can be a handshake, they can be verbal. But more than 12 months to be enforceable in court, they have to be in writing. Okay, let me ask you this then. 12 months. What if it's a 12-month lease with a 12-month option? Yeah. To um, extend. We don't have that. That same 12-sentence uh, um, law doesn't give us guidance on that point. So I'm, I'm a, unable to answer that question. But I can answer the question, is that how it's interpreted? And man, it gets complicated there because, Jeremy, courts, courts are not courts. Courts much more than a building. A court is a judge who's my age, your age, Bella's age, who's male, female, black, white, brown, yellow, red, what, whatever, who is this religion and that religion and, and who bleeds and, and, and loves and, and is in pain and whose, whose daughter has cancer and, and courts are more than this one judge. Courts have juries and those six person or 12 person juries are the same. And it's a cross section of humanity. And it's not just this sterile environment that follows left and right. Instead, the courts, judges, juries, bailiffs, marshals, sheriffs are all people, and they have what we call these equitable powers. And forget that word, it doesn't matter. They'll do what they just think is the right thing and throw out the law. And there was a case that was litigated. I wrote about this in my blog. I don't remember, maybe Bell remembers a year ago, two years ago. And I think it was about a lawyer in Texas who had a written lease, never signed it. And it was multiple years. And after multiple years elapsed, he said, but during the middle of what would have been a 10-year term, he went to the landlord and said, I'm out, I'm done, I'm through. Bad news. We don't have a written lease. It's not signed. But good news for me, I'm done. I'm out. And it was litigated and found by an appellate court, no lawyer. We're going to hold you to that terms of the written lease that you did not sign, meaning we're going to throw out this whole statute of frauds concept that oral leases for terms of 12 months have to be in writing. That's nothing more than a judge and a jury and everyone else who just put on their happy hat and said, it's unfair. Yeah. So, so you think, well, okay, well now it bounced to the appeals level where those guys do nothing but follow the law, right? The litigants are not in front of them. They're, they don't see the pain when the landlord shows up with the landlord's you know, one-year-old baby in, in, in diapers who's hungry. They don't see that. All they see are words on paper. People, too, and they make decisions that sometimes 
controvert what is in black and white law, and that's a perfect example. That's what happened there. So to your situation, could you have an oral lease with a term of more than 12 months, although the law says absolutely not? My answer is, yeah, you you can. Can you have an oral lease with only one party? Does there have to be two parties involved to contract? Two separate uh, parties. Could a landlord lease to himself then? Could a landlord be both the landlord and the tenant? No, that's not a lease. That's just somebody occupying space. So now, that's that's kind of what this guy did. He went, pff, pff. <laughs> no, no way. Wait, wait. <laughs> the landlord, you know, Joe Landlord is smart enough to form Joe Landlord LLC. Mm-hmm. And then Joe Landlord LLC owns the building and handshakes with Joe individually. Joe, you may stay. Joe, here's what you're going to pay. Then now all of a sudden, now I've got a lease. Yeah. So I have two different parties. Legally, I have two different parties. Legally, two different parties. Ownership is right pocket, left pocket, same one. Okay. Well, so that was a big curveball. I think we've worked all that one out, but that was... That was the fir- that was a first for me. Estoppel um, certificates are the way. Yeah. <laughs> well, luckily with this one, we we are going to get rid of these oral leases and have a real lease in place as we move forward when we close that deal. So you you touched on your your blog, and I think you started off at the beginning of our conversation with this on maybe you've kind of transitioned more into like, like loving the teaching aspect or, or sharing. Uh, oh yeah. That's, um, yeah, I, I have a blog, I write monthly and I just wrote article <laughs> 162. So how many years is that? That's a lot of years. <laughs> and, but over the years, what I found is there's this huge, huge need for people to perform legal services for free. And a lot of it's in stuff I don't do, uh, family law and divorce and, and guardianship and criminal law. And But some of it is stuff that I can do, obviously real estate law, but business law, some of it's landlord-tenant law. And so for the last... I don't know, five years, probably more. Every morning, the first thing that I do when I turn on my computer is I will give probably two hours of my day, my time, every morning on various websites to try and answer these uh, questions from those who cannot afford lawyers and then engage with them over a certain amount of days to kind of help them to what I hope is a better place. And that's been incredibly rewarding and to those who end up listening to this who are in a position to give back i highly highly commend it just try it just try it once if it doesn't leave a happy feeling in your heart you're dead so that's that's um one of our core values here is we give value without expectation and um you know in commercial real estate world a lot of people covet things and they it's a very uh close to the vest type uh industry and and uh you know, we, we share a lot of things with people here that, you know, maybe they don't reciprocate, but, you know, we don't hold on to that, you know. And so uh, there's a lot, you know, I've had people, numerous people call me and be like, hey, how, how would you work this situation? I have no tie to that person or, you know, no real need to, to work on that for them. But someone needs help. I feel like I need to help them. And I don't expect anything out of it. And so. aren't those your best moments? Too? Yeah. Seriously? Yeah. Isn't it, that what puts a smile on your face? Well, when it, that- it is because someone actually, I, you know, it's kind of goes back to the, uh, in a way, it kind of goes back to the music discussion we had on, you know, we were talking about, about, you know, what is, you know, this is probably kind of offline uh, earlier, but like, what is success? You know, I, you know, in my mind, I, I feel like I'm always looking for that, you know, failures described in the same way. But, uh, you know, I, I think that is one part of success is when someone looks, looks to you for advice because they feel like you are that subject matter expert and they need that help. And, you know, I need that help at some point on something, you know what I mean? I've had mentors in my life and I'm like, Hey, this is, I, I'm at a crossroads here. And, and that's I, a critical point you're bringing up now is we all need that help sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard to say. I don't know. It's hard to look at somebody in the face and say, I don't know. Yeah. 
No, it's um, so, you know, there's, there's been those points in my life. So if I can help someone with that, I mean, you know, it's interesting now is moving into, you know, I was a broker for so long now moving more into the principal role. I literally have brokers now that are, you know, they were my competitors. They're selling us buildings now, but like they literally will call me on a tenant rep deal and say, Hey man, I'm in this situation. Like what would, what would you have done here? And I'm like, no, this is probably the reality, you know, kind of like, this is probably how this situation plays out. And that's always, that's always a cool feeling to be like, and those are your very best moments of that day. Yeah. Cause I like, you know, what's cool to me is like, those are my peers to me because, you know, we, I grew up brokering with these guys for so long. I'll wager when you go home and talk to your family and somebody's nice enough to say, how was your day? What did you do today? (laughs) I don't know that you'll say those things because they may be confidential, but you'll think of those things. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, so that's, uh, I, I guess uh, we have a joke around here that I don't have any empathy, but Angie was telling me today. She goes, "Well, you got you got some empathy." That's, so wrong. <laughs> that's, that's a lawyer. That's a lawyer comment. <laughs> <laughs> well, so kind of let's let's kind of wrap this up here. But like, what you know, what you know, learning the law is very interesting. You know, I, I think uh, what books, resources, other you know. Uh, first off, your blog is is very interesting. We oh, always read you. it. Bella's a massive fan of it. Thank you. Um, uh, you know, that, I get like I get like two comments uh, every third year. Yeah. <laughs> no one ever responds. Ever, never. Well, so I, it's meaning I I have no clue who's reading it, and and whether it's you know millions or whether it's. Bella. You should probably have Bella market it for you. It would probably, it yeah, would like probably she's got get a lot time of traction. <laughs> so, um, but uh, I, I really encourage anybody listening to this to go read them. It's some of the most interesting, it, it just, it very interesting cases. Like, well, thank, um, you. thank you for that. You thank know, you. so that, that's always a, a pleasure. But what other resources, like, is there any other things, you know, that, that people could look to to learn more about laws or, or anything like that or just how the legal system works or? Yeah, I'll take it in a whole different direction. I'm a big um, nonfiction reader. Read military history. Pick any, any time, any, any continent, any time you want. Learn how to overcome. Learn how others overcome adversity, deal with adversity, mm-hmm. sometimes lose to adversity, and that will help you in law, in whatever your endeavor is, become a history uh, student, military history particularly, and because it's fascinating. Yeah. It's, it is some of the most fascinating reads that I've ever done. And I know that's a weird segue into law, but, but my point is perspective and, 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 and diligence and inquisitive mind and if you've got those three things then you'll be successful in law or whatever else that you do but just trying to you know to condense law into one volume if you're entering to your world your world specifically of uh landlord and tenant and purchases and sales and leases and title and survey and you wanted to know really boots on the ground, how the law works, type in these three words into Google, Texas property code, a couple hundred pages long. Unfortunately, it's all law. It'd be the driest thing. Want to go to sleep? (laughs) Got insomnia. (laughs) But most of my core legal issues, many of my core legal issues in Texas anyway, are answered by the Texas property code. That's what, as soon as we ran into that oral lease situation, that's immediately where I went. I was like, what, 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 what's the property code? <laughs> so, it, it is, you know, you know what, you know what it is? I, 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 it is a boring read, but it is in small snippets. It's in like Tell little, me you were able to get through that. It, it was in some bite-sized chunks. Just so like, tell me again, you were <laughs> able to read. You didn't read the whole property code. No, not the whole code. I okay. read the code on oral leases, okay. but, but that section was very small. So, but, uh, well, I, I think I think the big thing that I took away from this is that law is black and white on paper, and if it has to get off the paper, it has people involved in it, and people, if it gets off the paper, it has to go to court, and that's where that's where 
people get involved. Yeah, well, hopefully not go to hopefully maybe just interpret it, right? Yeah. Hopefully just guidance. Yeah. We hope as I've told the whole world, there's only one guy that wins when it goes to court, right? You know yeah. who that is? That's that's you. That's me. That's yeah. the only win the only one when when lawyers win a case, clients lose. When lawyers lose a case, clients lose. Attorney rates in litigation is just ridiculously high. Yeah. You gotta avoid that at all costs. You gotta do everything you can to avoid a lawsuit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Stuart, thank you for coming on. Thank you. We will have you on again because Love we it. just scratched the surface of of all the things you know and that'd be fun. So but uh thank you so much for coming out. Thank you for the opportunity. Alrighty. Thanks. <laughs>